Glacial geologists have never answered the cogent criticisms of Sir Henry Haworth, president of the Archaeological Institute of Great Britain near the close of the 19th century, who amassed a tremendous amount of evidence that most of the supposed ice sheet deposits may have been formed by a great flood sweeping down from the north. See especially his works, The Glacial Nightmare and the Flood, and Ice Water and, or Water, 1905, both published in London by Samson Lowe, Sear, Cyril, and Risington, but now out of print, obviously. Haworth was not defending Genesis, in which he was not a believer. But it was only concerned, only was concerned to show the scientific inadequacy of the glacial theory. It is perhaps illuminating to record the experience of one of the authors several years ago in the library of the University of Minnesota's Outstanding Department of Geology. Haworth's massive work, Ice Water, was found on the shelves and was borrowed for study. The first time in the 40 odd years of its residence, there had there that it had been ever been checked out or judging from the numerous page pairs still not cut apart from each other ever even open wow valuable work like that nobody ever looked at it as evidence that the ice age constitutes a catastrophe that is utterly inexplicable in terms of present processes one need only recall again the fact that there are dozens of hypotheses that have been advanced attempting to explain its cause and mechanism all have had grave defects, and none has yet been generally accepted. The biblical deluge, on the other hand, offers an eminently satisfactory explanation. The common combined effect of the uplift of the continents and mountain chains and removal of the protective canopy around the earth could have hardly have failed to induce a great snow and ice accumulations in the mountains and on the land near land areas near the near the poles and these glaciers and ice caps must have continued to accumulate and spread until they reached latitudes and altitudes at which the marginal temperatures causing rare causing many melting rates in the summers adequate to offset the accumulation rates in the winters the total amount of water locked up in these great glaciers during their greatest extent is not known as yet, but it may have been very great. The main evidence of this fact is in heavily lowered, greatly lowered sea levels of the Ice Age. In the past decade, a large amount of evidence has been amassed to show that ocean levels were at least 400 feet lower than at present. Richard Russell says, possibly much more is shown by such features as the continental shells, seamounts, submerged canyons, and terraces, and so on. It has been argued that once an ice sheet get, got started, it would probably grow rapidly and extensively. Brooks says this would perhaps be possible in the years immediately following the deluge. An abundant supply of moisture, strong polar winds, lowered polar temperatures, due both to removal of the thermal blanket and probable dense accumulation of volcanic dust particles in the atmosphere, newly uplifted mountains, essentially barren topography, and the denuded lands, all these and possible other factors could have contributed to the rapid accumulation and growth of ice sheets. These factors are all legitimately deduced from the record of the flood and would be quite sufficient to explain the ice age. The catastrophic nature thereof, however, will of course be unacceptable to many geologists. They got their own theories, and they don't care if something interferes with uh, uh, their th theories if it's more acceptable scientifically. No, no, we don't. We don't go with that. Evolution of Stokes cannot seem to accept the truth about the catastrophic flood, even when the evidence overwhelmingly supports it. Although extraordinary or even catastrophic events may have caused the ice ages and their oscillations, it is nevertheless true that the ideal theory ought, <laughs> ought to fit within the framework of uniformitarian principles. Wow. Don't let your uh, prejudices get in your way. Stokes, 
another look at the ice age. Nevertheless, the flood theory satisfactorily meets the requirements for a glacial age mechanism. The ideal theory must be prepared to explain simultaneous glaciations over the entire Earth. Last but not least, the theory must explain the greatest paradox of all. The evidence of cold and ice existing and increasing simultaneously with conditions that favored accelerated evaporation and precipitation. In general, the various aspects of glacial and Pleistocene geology as commonly held by geologists are quite in harmony with all our with our deductions from the biblical accounts, except with respect to the time age element. Some of the larger and more endurated physically hardened formations attributed to the so called Pleistocene period in the non glaciated areas are perhaps best grouped with the later so called tertiary deposits as formed during the last stages of the flood with the effects of uplifted involved, uplift involved. But most of the so-called Pleistocene deposits can be accepted as post-deluge, <coughs> associated with the continental glaciers, or with the equivalent events in unglaciated regions, and can be accepted substantially as interpreted by glacial geologists. Evidence for only one ice age, one glaciation. A lot of people say, why? Well, there's more than one ice age. It may be objected that a flood-induced glaciation does not account for the four glacial stages, which are quite generally accepted as composing the entire supposed Pleistocene glacial epoch. Glacial geologists believe that each of the four supposed stages was separated by a warm period comparable to that of the present, or perhaps even warmer. A glaciation, such as we have envisioned, as brought on by the deluge would more likely be more one event, not four separate events. In, effect, in fact, it is uncertain what could have terminated the Ice Age at all once it got started. As a matter of fact, the reason that it is so difficult to account theoretically for the evolutionist hypothesis of the four glacial ages may simply be that they never existed. It should not be thought that the evidence for the three earlier stages is the same is that for the last. It is the supposed earlier stages of glacial periods are evidenced according to evolutionists mainly by a deposit of gumbo till, supposedly a very mature and weathered clay soil containing small stones. It is explained that these gumbo tills are the weathered remnants of former till deposits. A till is an unstratified deposit of gravel, sand, and clay, which is considered evidence of glacial origin. The apparent depth of leaching of carbonates in these soils have been used as the chief basis of estimating their age of formation. If you do one thing and another, another, after why, it's just a cartoon. Not only are the earlier tills usually devoid of any of the typical glacial formations characterizing the last one, but also the latter shows no evidence of gumbo till formation as in the earlier ones. In addition to the lack of extensive evidence over large areas, <clears throat> All these factors, which provide limited local support for several glacial periods, can be explained on other grounds than large-scale glacial fluctuations in the climate. The picture that is beginning to emerge, then, is of one of one great glaciation brought on by the events associated with the Great Flood. Put that off to the side and keep checking it and checking it checking it. No, 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 that's, that's, that's a religious idea. The spreading ice sheets fanned out over areas which recently emerged from the floodwaters and probably is yet little vegetation and so were easily subject to tremendous corrosion. Great quantities of newly hardened rock materials were plucked up and carried along by the ice. Eventually, being deposited in some sort of moraine, an accumulation of earth and stones carried and finally deposited by a glacier, then probably we work by marginal streams in many cases. The glacial undoubtedly, the glacier undoubtedly waxed and waned a number of times, permitting a great variety of deposits to be formed along its margins, but there is no real justification for inferring long interglacial periods. 
Except relatively near the ice age edges, the climate was not materially affected, so that floral and faunal populations of considerable variety could exist reasonably clear. Near, it was only as the ice sheet finally began its permanent retreat that the kinds of organisms now adapted best to cold climates began to separate from those more fitted for temperate climates. In the temperate, and especially in the subtropical latitudes, where most of the biblical and other early peoples enacted their histories, very little influence by the glaciers of the glaciers would have been felt, with the probable exception of higher average precipitation than now occurs and of the re relatively lower sea level. This intimation of only one great glaciation has received very recent support from intensive studies made during the International Geophysical Year. A paper to be presented at the December meeting, this is years ago, of AAAS, AAAS, in Washington, D.C., will include a proposal for a wholly new concept of Ice Age history. Deposits formerly attributed to four or five separate Pleistocene glaciations, both in America and Europe, are deposited deposits of a single glaciation. This is worldwide stuff. Normal retreat of the borders of the ice cap permitted the Leverett Sea to expand into the valleys of southern New England and the lower Hudson Valley and in the Mississippi Basin over the whole area of the so-called Nebraskan, Kansan, Illinoisan glaciations, so that an immense ice marginal body of water was formed, extending from Ohio to Montana and from the Gulf of Mexico to the Wisconsin Driftless Area. Iceberg rafted erratic, erratic stones and boulders became grounded on the submerged topography of northern Kentucky, southwestern Missouri, and eastern Iowa, the so-called Iowan stage. Gumbo clays until recently interpreted to be weathered tills, were deposited within the expanse of the sea level waters, along with driftwood and other inorganic material, heretofore interpreted to be interglacial deposits. Immense caves, mounds of stratified drift mount deposited by glacial meltwater, and eskers, mounds of sand, gravel, and boulders deposited by a stream flowing on within or beneath a stagnant glacier were built by subglacial river rivers emerging from beneath the ice border underwater. Reduction of the ice age to unity shortens geologic history and nullifies the present meaning of the terms Nebraskan, Kansan, Illinois, Wisconsin, and several interglacials. Ice age history appears to have been influenced or regulated far less by climatic changes and moraine building than by the intermittent character of the great land movements which continue to the present. There is urgent need in America and Europe for a tectonic chronology of the Ice Age. Based on transatlantic correlation of marine stages and simultaneous timing of the continental uplifts. Richard Lugy, J.K. Charlesworth, though he favors the multi-glacial Hypothesis gives an extensive discussion of the arguments advanced in the past for a single glaciation, including a quite lengthy bibliography of writings of monoglacial geologists, especially in Europe. Quaternary Era, Volume 2, and so on. Lugie's suggestion, therefore, is not merely a current aberration. Lugie is a professor of geomorphology in the Graduate School of Geography at Clark University and is also Secretary of the Commission on Terrorist Studies around the Atlantic for the International Geographic Cold Union. He is currently writing a book on his proposed tectonic chronology of the glacial period. If this concept is accepted, and it certainly seems to be supported by much evidence, there must be a revolution in geological thought. One may anticipate, therefore, a great deal of resistance to it. Nevertheless, the evidence is there, and it is obvious, obviously correlates with the concept of post-deluge effects which we have been advocating. It appears in general that the concept of one great ice advance, which can be legitimately refer inferred from the deluge events, is supported by many independent lines of evidence, not only from the glacial deposits, but also from former lower sea levels, former lower ocean temperatures.